If your songs do well on Spotify, it means reach and revenue. Sending the right signals to Spotify can lead to huge audience growth driven by personalized playlists like Discover Weekly, but sending the wrong signals to Spotify, that can really ruin your presence there. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about that. You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby. DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. Musician. Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to episode number 305 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, where on this episode, we're going to be discussing five ways to ruin your Spotify presence. Yes, five ways you can take something that can be helpful and completely destroy it. <laughs> and many of you have done it. <laughs> it's and, a cautionary uh, episode. This caution, isn't advice. Yeah, cautionary tale. We don't want cautionary you to do these things and ruin your yes. Spotify presence. Yes. My name is Kevin Bruner. Joining me is Chris Robley. And Chris, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm starting to book some gigs for the summer. Yeah. Things feel like they've got some momentum going. How about you? Yeah, yeah, I've got some gigs coming up next month and just got back from the NAM show, which is the big instrument manufacturers conference convention. Was and, uh, Max Rebo there playing a circular keyboard synthesizer? I, type you know thing? what? It was it was about half the size of of normal NAMs. It was normal. It normally happens in January because of COVID. They moved it and it was a bit smaller. I hope all that returns next year. There were some, you know good people watching moments, but, uh, but it was just nice to be back and traveling again, going to events. And speaking of events, we have one coming up that you should be at. It's the DIY Musician Conference happening in Austin, Texas, August 26th through 28th. It's going to be amazing. We've all probably been feeling a little bit low on the inspiration and creative drive coming out of two years of just uncertainty and a lot of our plans being continually destroyed, <laughs> pushed aside, <laughs> changed, and it's time to get back on track. We have a conference planned that is really going to do that for you, and you need to be there. We're going to be announcing the keynotes very soon and all the sessions, so if you're not on our email list, you should be to check in with all that info, but good stuff coming. And right now tickets are just $149. But if you stay two nights or more at the hotel, the Hilton Austin, where the event is held, you will get your ticket for free. So head on over to DIYMusicianCon.com. We're going to have more interactive things than before. We're going to have more performances happening than ever before. We've got Major More DSP sponsors than ever. Before. Yeah, DSP is going to be there. YouTube's going to be doing some cool stuff. Lots of things that are going to be worth your time and effort to get to Austin. I'm excited for it, Chris, because I have told you that, like, around after Christmas, you know, we did a run of shows at Christmas. It just kind of felt like, ah, now what? You know, we're still in this COVID malaise, nothing's normal. When is it going to happen again? And I just was in a creative slump for a long time and feeling uninspired. And I'm ready to get back at it. And I know this conference is going to help me do it because there's going to be amazing information. So many great people there that it's just so much fun to learn from each other as we hang out and, and meet new yeah. people and connect with industry folks. And we, we should say that when we talk about it, particularly on this podcast, we have played up the in-person being all together aspect of it. But if for whatever reason you can't actually go to Austin, there is a virtual component this year. So um, a lot of the sessions will be live streamed. You can watch them from your couch if you know. Either you logistically you can't get there or you're just super lazy. You can <laughs> stay on your couch. I guess if you're that lazy, you wouldn't be watching content to help you do cool things with your music. But uh, there is a virtual component. And the yes. same ticket will get you either access. You can show up in person or watch on your computer. Yes, it's one ticket to rule them all. So you just need that one ticket. And even if you decide I can't make it to Austin, you can keep that ticket and join online. There are going to be some special things to cater to the online folks like networking. We did that with our virtual conference and it actually worked very well. The virtual conference we did in 2021, 
so yes, if you can't make it to Austin, you know you're going to be unable to travel or for whatever reason can't make it, you can still get a ticket and gain access. It's going to be worth your while and all the main content will be streamed live. So DIYMusicianCon.com and $149. You know, most people are spending more than that to fill up their gas tank these days. So <laughs> it's a bargain. Yeah. And we've tried to keep our prices low because we know everywhere else prices are going up. But that price only lasts until the middle of July. So don't wait. Get it locked in and also get that hotel deal because it's going to be, it's it's so amazing because the Hilton a couple of years ago, and, and those that you were at the 2019 conference saw that they remodeled and they made this real open lobby with lots of seats and there's a bar and a, a taco restaurant. I mean, how can you go wrong? Beer and tacos and people, that's all you need to survive in life. So that's what's going on in the lobby all day long. People just hanging out, learning from each other, getting inspired. And we hope to see you there in Austin. All right. Also, if you haven't clicked that subscribe button, you should do that now. Subscribe to the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, click that big red subscribe button. Hit a thumbs up. If you're listening on Spotify, hey, go ahead and share this with your friends or wherever you're listening. And uh, we're also on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast apps. So be sure you are subscribed and let's get into it. So Chris, we got a little table of contents here. And so... We're talking five ways to ruin your Spotify presence. And there's probably way more than five. <laughs> but so what, but we need some context. So if you're just someone that's like, I don't care, give me the list. And so I can move on. The list is coming in like the, the middle of the episode, because first we're going to talk why you can't afford to ignore or do poorly on Spotify context. We need some context. How the algorithms work, because if you don't understand that, a lot of the, a couple of the five things wouldn't even make sense. What Spotify considers quality engagement. And then we're going to list those five things you should not do with your music on Spotify. And then after that, we've got listener calls and emails. And I know when you were at NAM, you hung out with some artists who confessed, I, I won't name any names, but they confessed to being guilty of some of these five things and they totally screwed up their Spotify presence. Yeah, Correct? this this episode yeah. I think is timely because randomly, yeah, two different artists came up to me over the course of that weekend and said, I did this and now my account is all messed up. Do I just need to shut it down and start like create a new artist name or a new artist profile and redistribute all my music? Fortunately, in that one scenario, I, I feel like the person could recover from what they had done. And some other people have done similar things. We'll talk about it because it's in the five ways to ruin your Spotify presence. And if you have something to weigh in on, or if you've got a story about how you've destroyed your Spotify presence or some mistakes you've made related to that, or anything else you want to ask a question or talk to us about, you can do so. Call our listener line at 360-524-2209, or you can email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. And like I said, we've got two calls and some emails coming up later in the show. They're good ones. So you'll want to stick around for that. All right, Chris, why is Spotify so important for my music? I mean, yes. that seems like a odd, obvious question, but I think it's worth in the context of this discussion, framing it a little bit. Yeah. Well, the warning we gave at the beginning was if you do poorly on Spotify or even worse, if you get your music removed altogether, it can really have a devastating impact on your music career. Because Spotify is one of, if not the leading kind of dominant streaming platform for music discovery, when we're talking about sort of audio only on demand streaming. And this one platform was really kind of like at the vanguard of combining a bunch of previous stuff that existed in the world, but all on one place. And so really over the last 10 to 12 years, Spotify has combined record stores you know they had this endless digital catalog they've combined radio with things like playlists and other forms of passive listening that they have on their platform they've combined mixtapes into this platform because they have user generated playlists and i think still to this day they're the most kind of user friendly place to make and share playlists spotify is huge in terms of discovery and various kinds of editorial placement and marquee placement so there's a way in which they've also replaced pr 
and, you know, recommendation driven discovery. And then just like sort of artist marketing and branding stuff has been kind of sucked up into this platform as well, because they let you customize your profile. They have marquee canvas, audio ads, all this different stuff. So yes, in 2022, we know all that. And that is what Spotify is, but we should also take a minute to say, wow, they took six, seven, eight aspects of the music industry and just owned it all. Yeah. And I think what's important to also note, and I've been including this a bunch whenever I speak, like when I spoke at NAM, I included this, that that streaming isn't just a different format. We didn't just go from CD, okay, now it's downloads, and oh, and now it's streaming, but that streaming really created a fundamental shift in how consumers consume music. And I think like what you're saying, how it combined a lot of things that existed like record stores, radio, mixtapes. It also changed how people interact with music. And I think a lot of it is for the positive. And some of those things are, well, people are now talking to devices and asking, hey, play the song that sounds like this or that, that had this in the lyrics or by this artist. Uh, people are listening by mood or activity. And I think that's one of the big major shifts that became very clear early on in streaming because a lot of these playlists aren't about, aren't titled by the music they contain, but by the activity or mood that someone wants to create, whether it's coffee shop chill or chill piano or study chill playlist or, or probably make more sense to say chill study, study playlist, not study chill playlist. And, and all three of those you just mentioned are very gentle. They also have pump up fitness playlists. And yeah, it's like go for songs to rock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, songs to rock out in the gym to like so it's like all these things are based around activity keyword searches are huge and if you've you've done any deep dive in like user generated playlists that are driving a lot of activity oftentimes they've named their playlist sort of stumbled into some keywords that they didn't realize that other people would be searching for and that's how their playlist becomes huge collaborations with other artists and projects that you're a part of are a key thing that's driving consumption of new music and finding a song by lyrics and that's going to be more important in the future and continue to be added into platforms. And then algorithmic recommendations, very key. And uh, we're going to be talking about algorithms in a second. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of what you just said kind of highlights how Spotify is at the forefront of music's usability. It's kind of contextualization, it's composability across different contexts and stuff. So that is why it's such a powerful platform. It's why when you're doing well there, it means you can sort of compound that and do even better and better, reach more and more people. So you should do well there. And doing well often means appeasing Spotify's recommendation engine and you know doing the right things according to the algorithm. So I think we should talk next about, you know, not get super in the weeds. There's a lot of yeah. YouTube videos and blog posts you can read that really go into depth about the technicality and all this stuff. I think we just want to do like a quick surface level. Here's what you really need to know about the algorithm. And I think you could boil it all down to don't chase vanity metrics. The thing that you really want, at least very early on, is quality engagement over quantity for its own sake. Yeah. And I think, I think it's important. Uh, well, part of the reason why we're having this conversation, because, you know, said stop chasing vanity metrics, you want quality engagement, not quantity for its own sake is that why Spotify became so central is that they've given users the way to create an experience with playlists more so than any other platform and, and create this kind of interactive experience with music, but they've also given artists access to do a lot on the platform, unlike any other platform that we've ever seen that where music was being consumed before this point in time. And artists are always going to do stuff to try, <laughs> try and manipulate those vanity metrics. And we're always going to find ways to mess it up. <laughs> um, well, I mean, their entire business model relies on the algorithms, it's not just one algorithm, but yep. uh, their recommendation engine doing its job very well. And what its job is, isn't to force feed, you know, cookie cutter pop music to people to make them like it. It's to analyze their actual individual user habits, figure out what they like and make predictions based on what they think they'll like in the future, based on what they've done in the past. So essentially it's to give the people what they want. And if it weren't good at that, I mean, I find 
if for my algorithmic playlist, like Discover Weekly and Rele- Re- Release Radar, it's very good at this job. Occasionally, it'll throw in something random, but by and large, it's good at it. And if it wasn't, Spotify would see you know a mass exodus of their users, mm-hmm. um, and they haven't. They're still a very dominant platform, so that means the algorithm is just delivering music to the right people at the right time. It doesn't want to send a good song to the wrong person. It wants to send the right song to the right person. Yeah. And, and so all these things are, and by the way, algorithms are constantly being updated and, and, you know, we've been talking about algorithms for a little bit now as it pertains to like social media and and what your fans see, but basically all that is, is these, like Chris said, these, these, computer programs working in the background, trying to make sure that you have a good user experience, that you enjoy what you're finding. So you want to stay on the service and keep listening and keep paying that monthly fee. Yeah. And it's, I suppose to some degree, the algorithms are, it's a guessing game. They're taking calculated risks on what to recommend in the future, but the data that they're looking at to, to make those guesses are, are the things that we'll list now, which are the quality engagement metrics, the things that Spotify says, oh, these things are happening that mean that these certain people really love this music. So you want to get repeat listeners for your songs. You don't want someone to hear it once and then never listen again. You want them to come back for more. That shows that they like the song. Limited skips. If 20,000 people hear your song, but 95% of them skip it after 30 seconds, Spotify is going to say, oh, that's probably a shitty song. (laughs) <laughs> Let's not recommend that to anyone. A high follower to listener ratio is something you want. A high save to stream ratio. You know, you you don't want people just passively listening to music and doing nothing with it. You want them to save it or to add it to a playlist. That's another good indicator. Getting chatter out there in the music press and shares on social platforms. That is stuff that Spotify's algorithms actually do monitor. It's not just on-platform stuff. They're looking at what's happening in the blogosphere and on social. So there's probably many more things it's looking at. There's a popularity index that's given to every individual artist. That's like your popularity score. I think it goes from zero to a hundred ranked against every other artist on the entire platform. And there is a point at which once you're popularity score goes above a certain amount. I think it's 20 or 30, you know, some extra sort of goodwill gets built in, I think, to the Mm -hmm. algorithm. So you do have a little bit of an uphill fight until you prove yourself. But again, until you get that uh, quantity of engagement to have that popularity score be that high, whatever engagement you're getting, you want to make sure is quality over quantity. Yeah. And all these things you just listed are super important. You can see them in your Spotify for artist account most of them, the other ones like the the chatter and stuff like that, you can see a lot of that in, in chart metric. If you want to get more data, chart metric has a great deal for artists, a more stripped down, lighter version that costs less, but still gives you more data than you'll probably use, but does add in a lot of that extra info about like the chatter and what's happening on a, a whole slew of playlists and how you compare to other artists. But all those things are incredibly important because when we get to the five things, you're going to see how most of the activity people are doing are, are screwing up all of those metrics that you just listed out in a bad way to tell Spotify that this artist either isn't legit or nobody likes them. And we're doing it by accident. <laughs> right. Well, I also wanted to put a, a thing in this discussion where we acknowledge the common critique of all this algorithmic stuff and that is something like this i'm an artist i shouldn't have to appease some robot overlord and like squeeze my genius into this little like you know whatever widget so that people will hear my music and okay fine you can think of it that way cynically if you want but i think it's more helpful to remember the algorithm is in an almost literal way your audience. And what I mean by that is if the algorithm is doing its job correctly, it is the aggregate tastes of listeners. So if you want to give the people what they want, which hopefully you do to some extent, you know, at least you want your music to be enjoyed by fans, then that also means the algorithm is the connection point to those fans. It's not a robot overlord. It's helping you find your ideal audience. So 
Uh, yeah. Chris, is the is the future us just playing music in like a bubble with these robot overlords giving us a <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down? And that's it's the like whole a, music. That's the whole music experience. It's like, uh, you know, instead of uh, overlords in, to like me, instead of a, uh, American Idol or or the voice judges, it's just like three algorithms. Yes. Three flat, then they give a. <laughs> and and I should say the algorithms have been incredibly helpful for independent artists because the thing that Spotify knew early on, and I think this is one thing, another thing that I, I believe Spotify has been very helpful for independent artists is that they know that they can't keep people paying a subscription fee month after month if they just only feature top 40 music all the time that that will get old fast and people will find other ways to consume it. So the goal is to get them deeper into catalog. And that is one thing that Spotify has done that I've seen impact my band's music and other artists' music and, all, and thousands and thousands of artists here at CD Baby. So that is something that I think should be understood that this is trying to get people deeper into music, not just keep pitching them the same song over and over again. Yeah, and I think people hear about the algorithms and they think, oh, that means I need to get rid of my song intros. I need to have the hook at the beginning. I need to have some crazy synthesizer. Like, those are production trends and songwriting trends that are happening in pop music. But the algorithm, uh, on top of the fact that that listeners are sort of breaking down genre barriers, just want to serve the right music to the right people. So if you make niche music, it's going to help you get your songs in front of that niche audience. Yeah. And I do have a counterpoint to the algorithms because I think on the flip side, the one thing that I have noticed during the pandemic, I really started watching a lot of videos on YouTube. I didn't really use YouTube much before then. And now, you know, I'm watching multiple videos a day on YouTube. And it used to be when I opened YouTube because I hadn't used it much, I got a very wide random experience that was kind of interesting and it would pitch just random crazy stuff to me and they know how to read our minds but i i like orcas you know the the thing that people call killer whales they're really orcas they're fascinating animals and for some reason i just like them and they're here in the northwest and i live in the Did, northwest are we turning and this I, into a nature show now yes yes okay. no so i click on a video and then suddenly every video it's recommending me is about orcas i'm like I liked orcas, but I don't want the 24 seven orca feed. That's not <laughs> same thing with roller coasters. I love roller coasters. If you say, Hey, would you ride the scariest, craziest roller coaster with me? My answer is always yes. And I click on a video and suddenly my whole feed is roller coasters <laughs> and that's fun for a day or two, but I, I don't want my experience to be so limited. And I find I'm having that issue with music. And also right now, my 12 year old, is sharing my Spotify account with me. So I can always tell when she's been listening because I'm randomly getting like- uh, Got a lot of Encanto. Uh, Encanto, My Little Pony, all this stuff that pops up. I'm like, what is this? So it can really mess up your algorithm. I've heard people say, no, I don't want to click on that because I don't want the algorithm to think I like it. <laughs> so I do think, you know, when I look at music, like sometimes I feel like there's so much music out there and that the algorithm is kind of like, we know Kevin loves these things, like love, love, loves these things. But I love more than just those, you know, the pinnacle of my, you know, my go-to type stuff. I, I have a wide musical taste, but I feel like the algorithm is just trying to tap into what really scratches the itch. And mm. sometimes I feel that can be unhelpful. And I look at Spotify and go, I don't even remember what I like anymore because <laughs> I can't think of anything beyond these, you know. <laughs> 20 bands it keeps showing me so it's what it's doing for political polarization on uh, other platforms it's doing to your musical tastes yeah like if you look at my spotify homepage, it's like hip-hop doesn't exist <laughs> and it's like the top genre out there right now and i like some of, of those artists they're not my go-to i like lots of genres that aren't my go-to and i like listening to but yeah it's very much rock music is what you see um, like you need so to, anyway, to that actively resists some recommendations. Then, so some of the things people are doing to destroy their Spotify account really messes with the algorithm, with really making sure no one, no one will ever see your music. So, Chris, we know a lot of artists make mistakes driving traffic to Spotify, but 
you can drive quality engagement with some of these marketing tools, can't you? You can, you can. And the, the obvious starting place is your existing audience. Like they're the most likely people to love whatever you put out next because they love what you put out before. So making sure you do whatever you can to drive them to Spotify, encourage them to take those actions that will help you and help show the algorithm they like the music. You could do targeted ads through Reels or TikTok or Show.co. And the other is, you know, decent press campaigns and just decent social activity in general. Those are three things that the algorithm will notice in a good way. But maybe we should now get into the five things they'll notice. Yes. In the so here are the five things, five ways to ruin your Spotify presence. And yeah, here we go. Don't do these. <laughs> Don't, Don't do it. Number one, don't send junk traffic to Spotify. And this could be something as simple as like you scrape together a bunch of old email addresses and now you're sending a Spotify link to that list. Those people aren't your fans. When they get to Spotify, they're probably not going to love your music. Another really common thing is sending kind of cheap traffic from social to Spotify. And you might think, oh, it's really cheap for me to advertise in the Philippines, Malaysia, you know, whatever. I don't want to single out any particular countries and make anyone feel bad, but there are various priced markets to advertise to. And the cheap ones look good at first because you think, oh, I'll get 10,000 streams or whatever. But instead, what you get is 10,000 people who click the ad, go through, and probably don't even listen. But if they do, they might skip it after 10 seconds because you haven't put them through enough of a journey to weed out all the junk traffic so the people you eventually send to Spotify are the ones who like your music. There are a bunch of other marketing tactics people use that send junk traffic. Like Contests are great, but if the prize of the contest is misaligned with the objective, it can be bad. So one example might be like, hey, a $50 Amazon gift card to one lucky person who streams my song or something. And, you know, show.co has a stream to unlock campaign type, which means something will unlock after someone listens to 30 seconds of the song. That can be great in the right context. But if you're paying through a, an Amazon gift card prize, well, everyone's going to listen to 30 seconds to qualify for the money and then they'll stop. So that's just one more example of junk traffic. Yeah, and that, that really can hurt you with a lot of people, you know, streaming part of a song and bailing. Like that list you had, the repeat listens, limited skips, high follower, follower to listener ratio. That's going to hurt all of those because it's going to see a lot of people hitting a track and not taking action, not saving it, not playing it again. And if it's not clear at this point, when we're talking about algorithms and, and ways to ruin your presence, we're talking about data. Everything is data. So it's like everything is being analyzed and looked at to see what is happening. Are people enjoying this piece of content, this music? Are people not liking it? It's all data. That's why it's important for you to understand the data in your accounts to, to see where you're at and maybe do things to move things in the right direction. Yeah. The second thing people do that can be very unhelpful is focus their efforts on getting their songs onto unhelpful playlists. And by unhelpful, I mean simply that kind of a random, maybe user-generated playlist that gets a lot of traffic, gets a lot of plays, but you're going to sit amongst a mix of other artists who might be more famous than you. And so it puts you into this passive listening environment that will possibly send the wrong message. And an example of this is like, I had a song on a nineties rock playlist that did well, like in terms of streams did well for my song. I think that playlist got me 20 something thousand streams. And so in that way it's gratifying. Okay, cool. But then I notice, Oh, everyone else on this playlist is Soundgarden and Nirvana and <laughs> the artists that are, that people are actually there to listen to which means my song's at even more of a disadvantage. They've never heard of it. It's slightly out of time and context because it was made in 2012 or whatever. But so then all these people, all this traffic is going to be listening to that song and they might even get to the end. Great. They might even enjoy it, but not enough to interrupt their day where they're going to check out my profile <laughs> or do anything else because guess who's waiting after me? Chris Cornell or whatever. Like, the stuff they're really there for. So focusing on just getting all this passive playlisting 
can be detrimental. There are cases in which it can be great as well. So I don't want to paint it entirely in a bad light. I just think when it's your sole obsession, it can be detrimental. Yeah, I used one of those playlisting pitching services. It was a legit service. I, they're probably not even in existence anymore because I tried a bunch of them, le the legit ones that existed at the time. And they got my one of my band songs on an 80s playlist. And I'm like, we weren't even making music in the 80s. <laughs> I was in elementary school and junior high. And so I thought the same exact experience that you just said. It's like, there's this 80s song like Bon Jovi plays and then Small Town Poet plays and then some other 80s band plays. It's like, those people are not there for our track. It's more confusing than anything. And it really ties your music. Again, this is all about data in this scenario. It's saying that your track is related to these things to some extent. It can. If that playlist is getting a lot of activity, it can really say, oh, people that love 80s music love this band, but it could be just a fluke. And so that one opportunity, like being in that playlist, I wasn't looking at going, oh, this is the worst thing ever. But when it happened, I was like, yeah, we're getting some streams, but nobody here is going to be a fan. All the streams aren't going to save it. So it's driving down the number of listens per saves ratio. And it was just driving down a lot of those metrics because these aren't people that thought they were going to hear us or interested in hearing us. They may like the song and let it play, but that's not the right context and it's not helpful. Yeah. Well, and I don't claim to be an expert in all the ins and outs of how their algorithms function at Spotify, but maybe there's some benefit in showing Spotify that your song is perfectly fine for passive listening. Maybe it's, you know, oh, people listen all the way through. Maybe there's some points you get for that, but it's definitely not showing them that people love your song. So it's like the difference between good enough and great, I guess. Yeah. Yes, exactly. All right. Number three. Number three is a biggie. Oh, why do people still do this? <laughs> they take out their credit card and they pay for plays. Maybe they're paying people who again are not fans because they're being paid, or maybe more likely you're paying a bot or 10,000 bots or whatever to go and stream your song. So your number ticks up and you look cool and you feel a li little bit better, but why do you feel better? You're lying to yourself. You know, <laughs> they're not real fans. They're not real people. It's not real engagement. So if that's making you feel better, there's something wrong. Uh, you're lying yeah, to yourself. It and I can tell you from the moment anyone makes metrics visible to everyone, this happened back in the MySpace days, artists will try to do things to artificially jack up those metrics. You are not fooling anyone. First off, unlike other platforms like social media, on Spotify, anyone can see extended data about your music using services like Chartmetric and, and so forth. They can log in and see some of this information that is clear that this is fake traffic. If you have millions and millions and millions of streams and a couple hundred followers, a couple hundred followers. <laughs> there's a problem there. And some of the other things like the, the saves and stuff, people can see. Uh, not on Spotify itself, but things like chart metric, and they can see that there's something wrong here. Something seems off. So it's not doing anything good for you. And even worse, Spotify does not want to pay royalties on fraudulent traffic. So they are going to shut you down. I mean, this is what that artist was talking to me about. They had paid, they knew it was going to be fake traffic too. And so, yeah, don't do it. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. And don't do it. It's not helpful. It doesn't make your music career. Well, and when you say Spotify is not going to pay royalties on fraudulent traffic, and so they'll take it down. I don't want to speak on their behalf about any kind of consistent application of rules, but that could mean they take down the release. But if this stuff happens enough, I've heard of instances where the artist profile <laughs> gets sh shut down, like the entire catalog you have. Now, I don't know what you have to do to, you know, three strikes you're out or what the what their ruling is, but it can be bad. The consequences can be very dire. So don't do it to begin with. Yeah. And the artist I was talking to that had done this, it was just that it just messed up all their, their data and analytics and stuff like that. And yeah, it's, it's not good. I haven't seen as many of these ads 
on social as I used to. Maybe the platforms just figured I'm not interested in that stuff because I don't click on it. Actually, I do click on it from time to time to see how scammy they are. But if you're seeing guaranteed 500,000 streams or guaranteed a million streams, run. Do not give them your money. It doesn't matter if it's 50 bucks or 10 bucks. The cheaper it is, the worse situation you're going to find yourself in because it's just bot farms and, you know, fake traffic that's not going to do anything for your career. And at the end of the day, you're going to feel kind of crappy because it's like, so what if it says 2 million next to the track, you know, it's not real. Right. And then you sort of alluded to this, but it muddies up Spotify's ability to go back through and weed through this to find who your real fans are because now you've got a million or two million, million fake streams and it is important. They have this sort of interconnected mesh or I don't know what you call it and in data terms of related artists based on listening habits. So, you know, oh, Kevin liked Guns N' Roses and he also liked Phil Keggy and he also liked whatever, Stone Double Pilots or something. And so now to All them- accurate. <laughs> to to them, for you as one user, you are linked to these three artists, but you're also, um, you know, they'll look at Phil Keggy fans and does, is there overlap between Phil Keggy and Stone Double Pilots? Or, I don't know if there would be, but sure there would be. Since Guitar they're inter- lovers. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but basically what I'm saying is they're interconnecting all artists and all listeners through this very complicated web to see what the little hotspots and, and um, avenues of connection are. And if you just sent 2 million bots to stream your song, it's not doing you any favors in connecting you to other similar artists or real listeners. So, Yeah, and you and I actually had an experience where I had purchased this marketing uh, program that was, you know, it was really about creating effective Facebook ads that drive Spotify plays. And it was supposed to be like real plays. And you and I both did this program and the, the ads and, uh, you know, the thing that was interesting, I learned a lot more about the Facebook platform and it was using a different ad type that I wasn't as familiar with at the time. And it was more based on uh, stories stories which, at the time. Yeah, yeah. Cause that was, that was newer. It, that was a few years back and, and them using that as an ad and very quickly, you know, I was getting lots of cheap traffic and the ads were the me- metrics on the ads were amazing. And this, person's focus was like, instead of focusing on expensive markets like the United States, go to these other markets outside the US that are cheaper. And the ad was performing well, and it was driving people to Spotify. And I was seeing very little, if to no uptick in plays, even though the ad was getting like an enormous amount of click throughs. So that immediately was some warning signs. And Mm -hmm. I shut the whole thing off. And I know you and I were doing this about the same time. And we both looked at it going, I don't, I don't think 10,000 mission. (laughs) I don't think 10,000 people just suddenly loved our music from Indonesia, but were inspired enough to click through, but then didn't listen to the track at all. Yeah. We bailed, we bailed quick. And yeah, uh, since then I had way more success taking the complete opposite approach of just doing a content ad on social that didn't require anyone to leave. They just had to consume it and hopefully they like it. Then the people who did like it, I served them a Spotify ad and that actually saw, you know, not the same kind of traffic engagement that our Indonesia ad did, but I noticed on Spotify, a much higher save to stream ratio and actual plays were happening. So just go to show you. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not even like buying. I, I, I I say that because it's not even about just like, oh, this company pitched me this program well, like this guarantee will give you 500 streams. Like this program, that marketing program we we purchased was legitimate. And it was actually more about how to create effective Spotify ads. But it was clear that in those territories, there was a lot of nefarious activity happening. And at that time, I think there was even accusations that Facebook was partly manufacturing this stuff to drive ad rates. Don't know if that's true or not. Would not surprise me based on the other things that have happened over at Facebook. <laughs> But at the same time, everything we were doing was legit, but there were some warning signs that the traffic we may be sending was bots. And so therefore it was like eject immediately. So you might find yourself in that situation where you're just testing some ads and it seems like this ad's performing well. You got to look at the data to make sure that, is there something fishy here? This is weird. I'm not doing anything wrong or trying to 
do anything fraudulent, but stuff is just fraudulent on the internet as it is sometimes. And you got to be careful. Yes, indeed. The fourth thing we probably talk about very quickly, but this mistake is just simply not using the tools that Spotify makes available. And I'm sure a, a an expert in the algorithms could tell you whether officially not customizing your profile and things like that dings your algorithmic ranking or anything like that. I don't know. What I do know is that anytime you show up on an artist profile that looks like a ghost town because there's no customization, they haven't updated anything, just looks like a store that's gone out of business. So it's not exciting. Playlisters or fans are going to have the same emotional reaction or response when they get to your profile. So you want to use all the tools they make available, all the customization options. You want to pitch every time you have a new single coming out. Upload a canvas before the song is released, pin a playlist or a song or a, a concert date or something, to top your profile. If you qualify for it, you should consider using marquees. And then last thing I would remind people of is the follow button itself on your profile is a feature that Spotify offers. So use it, drive people to follow you. Yeah, the, the pitching tool and everything you find in Spotify for artists, I think why it's important is it adds data and information, not only for the, just the algorithms, but for editors and fans. So editors that work at Spotify that are looking for music to feature in various playlists, but also fans and other music curators. We came from a world where in, independent artists didn't even have access to have space on shelves in stores to now they've given us the same options as major label artists and if you're not taking advantage of that, it looks like, like you said, a, a store that's gone out of business, but put a bio in there, keep it updated. That's information that people can grab onto, that the system can grab onto, the editors can grab onto. The pitching tool, what I like about it is it gives you the ability to add more data about your music as well. So it asks about featured instruments in it and you can describe it and, and say what's going on with your with your career at that time and any highlights they should know about. All those things are helpful with people making decisions. But if you just leave everything blank, you go to a, a band's website, especially when you don't have much music released yet, or a band's Spotify profile, and it looks just kind of empty and you know vacant, it kind of makes you as a fan go, mm, maybe I shouldn't like this. <laughs> Was it Twitter that used to have the egg? Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you didn't have a profile picture, you were yes. just an egg. It's, it's like the Spotify equivalent. The last thing on our list is something I'm guilty of lately. I haven't put out anything since January. So what's that? It's going on six months. But uh, not releasing music frequently enough is a very common mistake. I'm making it right now. And that means you're going to you're gonna lose steam, maybe motivationally, but also your your fans are going to feel a little out of touch you haven't reminded them that you're around and that you come back and enjoy your music again but all that also means you're probably going to lose algorithmic steam because while it's not a hundred percent true that they only recommend new music they definitely favor new music when recommending things and there is a certain window of time at which your newest song sort of ages out of the period in which it is most likely to be recommended yeah and this is something that it's clear when you're in a release, a pattern of release, or what I, I tend to call a season of release, that all that activity sort of snowballs on top of each other and, and builds momentum. And when you stop it, it definitely feels like things just kind of slump for a while. But beyond just like what we may perceive like and speculate the algorithms doing when we're releasing more music it's clear that when you're releasing more music it pushes its release radar to your fans it does those kind of things that the system is designed to do to keep engagement going so it is something that's important to consider and if you just release an album and disappear for three years and then release something else that you're not going to have the same impact that you would if you've been releasing more regularly Sure, there are always exceptions to this idea, but by and large, what we've seen and talking to lots of artists and seeing lots of releases, both from majors and indies, that uh, seems to ring true. Well, what I like about preparing to not make this mistake is that it also sets you up to do some things that 
Spotify generally favors. So what I mean is you're going to do, you know, a few lead up singles to a bigger album, an EP or, or an LP. And then maybe you've got a mix of things to share afterwards to keep telling that story. It could be those B-sides, unreleased stuff, live recording, stuff like that. But it also might mean cover songs and collaborations. And those are two things that Spotify potentially will give you an extra boost for. Cover songs have, like we said in a few episodes ago, like a built-in audience, built-in interest. And so there's potentially more playlisting spots to put that song on, which is good for you. And then collaborations give you sort of a cross artist or cross genre recommendation options as well, because those fans of that other person you're working with will hear this song as well. So in sort of preparing to not lose this algorithmic steam, you might also be kind of accidentally doing things that will do better than your normal kind of everyday original music that's just your own. Agreed. Agreed. That's the five things, uh, five ways to ruin your Spotify presence. And what did if, we you've got, <laughs> if you've got a sixth or a seventh thing that we didn't do, or if you've done some of these things and had to deal with the fallout, or you just want to weigh in on something else, you can do so. Call our listener line at 360-524-2209 or email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. This is a safe space. So if you are vulnerable and say, hey, I made this mistake, I fell for this scam, we won't make fun of you. We want you to share because it's, it's, I find myself like, oh, I want to push that button so bad. I want to push that <laughs> button so bad and buy this thing. <laughs> but, but here's my hot take. This is my hot take for the episode. You will never have a successful music career built on fake traffic, bots, profiles that don't exist and people who aren't listening to your music. A music career is built on music that people enjoy, that they wanna come back to and listen to over and over again, and that should be your focus. So if you see something that looks too good to be true, it is because it's not real people listening to your great music. And anything else other than that is not building your music career and excitement around what you do as an artist. So focus on those things and use the tools and the information that you have to build the right audience that loves your music. There you have it. And, and I'll, I will add to that. If you pay for bot traffic or junk traffic, your numbers go up and that makes you feel good. You've got some serious soul searching to do because you got to <laughs> dig into your insecurity you're lying to yourself. <laughs> We've got this illusion in the world right now that likes and views mean real fans and an audience. But we've been chasing likes to for most artists to no avail that it's not a lot of times not the based on what we're doing as artists. And we've got to focus on making great music. A music career that I know the people listening to this podcast want to build is not built on a flash in the pan gimmick that's here today, gone tomorrow. Reminds me of a documentary you and I both just watched. <laughs> oh, Chris and I were all fired up. Uh, yeah, it definitely. We we're, it might have changed the direction of our future TikTok episode we're working on. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll save my gripe for that episode. <laughs> yeah, because that, that one might need to be a two-parter. The death of artistry. <laughs> anyway, again, if you've got something you want to share, call our listener line 360-524-2209 or email us at podcast at cdbabypodcast.com. That was fun. Yeah, that was that was good. I'm I I think we got another good one in the books. We should have a whole ongoing segment series where it's just us reading funny scam music emails <laughs> that would be amazing or we dms start, they don't have to just we be should emails start collecting them yes if you're getting those let, we should start start reading like the scam email of the day <laughs> of the episode that would be perfect we Send should do that us. i'll start i'll start copying those i get on instagram because that's that's fun uh that's fun <laughs> all right well we thank you for joining us and we will catch you again next time take it easy see ya Thank you.